When you arrive at the underworld, one of the best places to go to is the Ninth Circle. The Ninth Circle is named after the Ninth Circle of Hell in Dante's Inferno. The Ninth Circle was a place for torment for those who were treacherous, those who betrayed their friends and country. It's a fitting name for this bar and its owner, as we will soon learn. The proprietor of this establishment is a ghoul called Azrakal, a well-dressed sly businessman who really likes his radio. Read all. Quiet makes people stop drinking. Turn the radio back on. That hurts. He just will not let you turn the thing off. Hey, leave that alone. If I wanted it off, I'd turn it off. We see many of the ghoul residents of the underworld enjoying themselves in this bar. There's lots of food and plenty of beer set out on the tables. It's also here where we will bump into Sydney if we previously met her at the National Archives. Well, 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 if it isn't the greatest American hero, or Abraham Washington's greatest anyway. I figured we'd bump into each other again. What brings you all the way out to Ghoulsville? What are you doing in the underworld, Sydney? My new line of work, actually. I've used the proceeds from our last acquisition to set myself up as an ammunition vendor. Pretty cool, huh? No more risking my neck to recover bits of junk for money. Now, the cash comes right to me. Care to take a look at my inventory? After completing her story, she becomes an ammunition merchant. She has a lot of nice ammunition and even a few minor weapons. I did a video dedicated to the National Archives in which I told Sydney's entire and poignant story. You can watch that movie here. In the Ninth Circle, we also find Mr. Crowley. You stole what was rightfully mine. Get lost. If we decided to keep him alive, that is. It was from Mr. Crowley that we got the quest, You Gotta Shoot Him in the Head, which culminates in raiding Fort Constantine of its treasure. I also did a video on that quest, and if interested, you can watch it here. But aside from these interesting characters, the only other named characters we find in the Ninth Circle is Azrakul the bartender himself, and a man in the corner named Sharon. Sharon does not move. He stands as a sentinel 24 hours a day. When Azrakul sleeps, Sharon stands. He's also unique in that he's considerably taller than every other NPC in the game, even the Lone Wanderer. Here I am in a full suit of T-51 power armor, and Azrakul still stands a head taller than me. This is a female Lone Wanderer, but the same is true for the male. But if we try to talk to this fascinating giant of a man, he refuses. No, go talk to Azrakul. I just... Talk to Azrakul. Yeah, but... Talk to Azrakul. We seem to be getting nowhere with the guy, so instead, let's turn around and talk with the proprietor of this pub, Azrakul himself. Cool. A human. I don't care. The caps all spend the same. Hey, Azrakul, who's that guy over in the corner there? That's Sharon. Let's just say, well, he's a loyal employee. Don't mess with me, and he won't mess with you. He's a loyal employee? What do you mean? I hold his contract, which makes me his employer. He will do what I ask, when I ask, without question. You see, Sharon grew up around a very interesting group of individuals. They, well, I guess you could say that they brainwashed him. He is absolutely loyal to whomever holds his contract. Unfailing, unflinching, until the day that employment ends. Don't get me wrong. I have no doubt that he holds no end of animosity towards me. But so long as he is my employee, he is as gentle as a teddy bear. So, he's your slave? No, he is not. Ma'am, you insult me. I do not believe in slavery. It is an abomination. I am a firm believer in personal choice. To force another person into bondage is unthinkable. 
Chains are earned, never forced. Sharon made some choices that landed him in my employ. The matters of our contract is between him and I. No one else. He doesn't say much, does he? His company is rather refreshing, isn't it? But don't mistake his brevity for stupidity. That would be very unwise. Underestimating an opponent has been the last mistake of far too many individuals throughout history. What does he do for you? Watches over the bar, keeps the drunks in line. Pretty much, I point at something and Sharon hurts it. He's the best thug a corrupt bartender could ever ask for. He never bothers me with his own annoying sense of morality. Seems like a handy guy to have around. Maybe a handy guy to watch my back wandering the wasteland. Hey, Azrakal, I want to talk with you about Sharon's contract. Oh, would you now? He's a highly valuable asset to me and to the Ninth Circle. What did you have in mind? Tell you what, I got a thousand shiny caps in this pocket here. How about I give them to you? <laughs> You're kidding, right? <laughs> Come back when you have a serious offer. Oh, Two thousand, though. That's that's a bit rich for my blood. Hey, uh, couldn't we work out some sort of deal? I suppose we could do that. Uh, although you might not like the deal that I have to offer. You see, I don't like competition. Not at all. It goes against every principle that I have as a businessman. So the fact that there is another source for booze in town troubles me. Greta, the waitress over at Carol's, I want you to kill her. I don't care how. Just make it quiet. Do it, and you can have Sharon's contract. Huh. Uh, well, why not have Sharon do it? Loyal employee that he is, Sharon would do it without question if I asked him to. However, the entire town would come down on me for it. Greta is quite popular around here. If Sharon is the one who kills her, everyone will know that it was me who ordered Greta's death. I need Sharon clearly visible and in public when Greta dies, so that I can fairly claim ignorance of the situation. Sure. Greta is nothing to me. I'll do it. I'm glad to hear it. Come back to me when she's dead, and Sharon's contract is all yours. A word of advice. Be subtle. Open gunplay will only get the town to turn on you, and I will not be able to help you. Hey, since I'm here, I need a drink. Your misery, my wealth. He has a standard assortment of booze, but he also has a special menu. Hey, uh, Azrako, let me see the real goods. Why, whatever do you mean? I'm a simple barkeep, nothing more. Well, then I guess I'll just take my cap someplace else. Oh, now, 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 don't be hasty. I'm sure that we can work out a compromise. Look at these people, Azrakal. They're jetting. Trust me, I know. Ah, an educated consumer. My favorite kind. Yes, yes, I think I can help you. Simply... Step over here, my friend, and I'll show you my stock of more potent goods. Why do you bother to hide what you sell? While there is no law in Underworld, per se, I'd rather not end up at the receiving end of an angry lynch mob. There's no shortage of do-gooders around here, and it would be just like them to take it upon themselves to interfere in a fair business transaction. Honestly, I have something to sell, and you want to buy it. Now, why is that anyone else's business, huh? After this dialogue tree, we gain access to Kems from Azrakul, making him a versatile and useful merchant. Hey, Azrakul, what can you tell me about the underworld here? It's the only place in the capital wasteland where my people can escape the misery of the world above. And that misery... 
Well, it makes a man like me very happy and very, very wealthy. To find Greta, we need to go into Carol's place, an inn and competing restaurant directly across from the Ninth Circle. Greta is just a waitress. She doesn't run this place. Carol runs this place, hence its name. So it's interesting that Azrakul wants Greta dead and not Carol. You'd think he'd want to go for the person who owns his competition, not the person serving the drinks. But at any rate, we find Carol manning her shop, and before we murder her helper, we can get to know her a little bit better. Yeah, what is it? Oh, oh my, someone new. I'm so sorry. You must think me terribly rude. Welcome. Welcome to Carol's place. I'm Carol. It's not much I know, but it's mine. So if you need anything, just let me know. Greta will get you any food you want, and I handle the rooms. It's so good to have someone new here, especially a pretty young smooth skin like yourself. I hope you like it here. So do you run this place with Greta? That's right. Her and I have been together for, oh, about 60 years now. But things haven't really been the same since Gob left. He was like a son to me. I think Greta was always a little jealous of him. Oh, so she's more than an employee and a work associate. She's your partner. Well, uh, how did you end up here? Oh, that's such a long story. You couldn't possibly want to hear about that. You know, you're right. I don't. See, I knew it. I'm really just a boring old ghoul. I promise. I changed my mind. Carol, I would love to hear your story. Well, okay. But it's nothing special. I was born in 2051, so yes, that makes me a pre-war ghoul. Oh, wow. Well, do you remember the day the war started? I do. I was in a shelter with my father when the bombs hit. In D.C., we had the luxury of getting a warning after the West Coast was... gone. I was just a little girl then. We couldn't afford a space in one of the vaults. I remember filing down into that shelter, my father rushing me in. He stopped to help this one family. And I looked up and called his name. There was a flash of light brighter than anything you can imagine. I woke up a few hours later. The first thing I did was run up to where my father had been. He... he was gone. But the strangest thing... There was his shadow, burned into the wall, so crisp and clear, like he was standing next to me. The heat had burned it into the concrete. This actually is a real thing. I was shocked to learn that when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the blasts left behind shadows against walls, against concrete sidewalks, of the people who had stood in those exact places before they were vaporized by the blast. And as Carol says, these shadows are permanent. These are called nuclear shadows. The way that these are formed is similar to the way that the sun will bleach bright colors if those colors are left out in the sun for too long. Have you ever seen a poster that's been stapled to the side of a wall or a billboard for years? The colors are all gone, and that's because the ultraviolet radiation from the sun has bleached them. Well, the intense radiation that came from the blasts at Hiroshima and Nagasaki bleached hard permanent structures like rock cement and brick. But if anything stood directly in the path between the blast and the hard surface, the radiation couldn't fully reach that wall to bleach it. And so we find a silhouette of whatever had stood in its path, a ladder, a bicycle, and in many cases, a person still in the act of performing whatever task that person was doing the very moment he or she was vaporized. This is what happened to Carol's father. I looked around many of the metro stations and underground bunkers near to the Museum of History, but I didn't find any shadows on the wall, so I don't think Bethesda included it in the game. I also couldn't find any reference online, so I doubt it's there. But Carol, what was the wasteland like after the war? The city was on fire for weeks, maybe months, I don't know. 
I hid down here in the museum. It was the closest building to the shelter I was in. But I could hear what was happening above. People howling like animals, chaos, looting, killing. It's like every foul thing inside of them came out. It was a nightmare. I... I don't want to talk about it. So how did you end up a ghoul? I don't know how it happens. Dr. Burroughs says it was radiation. All I know is that people kept showing up here in the museum. After things calmed down above ground, we tried to live down here as best we could. After a while, things got strange. My skin started to get dry and flake off. Everyone's did. It took a while. Months. Maybe a year. But sooner or later, everyone ended up like this. Some of them went crazy. Some of us just accepted it. After a while, other ghouls would find their way in here, and Underworld just sort of grew. No one bothered us down here. We were happy enough to leave them alone. And once my Greta showed up, it was a good enough life for me. Now, there are a couple of things that don't add up here. She told us that when the bombs dropped, she was a little girl. She was even staying with her dad. But it only took a month or a year after the bombs dropped for her skin to flake off and for she and everyone here in the underworld to become ghouls. But we know from the Billy the Kid in a Fridge encounter from Fallout 4 that once a person becomes a ghoul, they stop growing. That if you become a ghoul as a child, you remain a child forever. Why then does Carol here look like a grown woman? Also, her dates are completely wrong. She claims to have been born in 2051, but we know that the bombs dropped in 2077, which would have made her 25 years old. Not a little girl, as she claimed. It could be, however, that since she's over 200 years old by this point, maybe in her mind she feels like that moment in time was when she was a little girl. Maybe that memory is so far in the past that to her, she was just a child, even though she was 25 years old. Regardless, Carol's story is not boring at all. It's really interesting. See, Carol, and you said that you weren't interesting. You tell the same story for 200 years, you'll feel pretty uninteresting too. Hey, what can you tell me about the underworld, Carol? I've been here since we founded the town. Before that, well, life out in the wastes wasn't very pleasant for us. But so long as we stay down here, we can live our lives as people, not monsters. I think things are better this way for everyone. So, this is the woman whose partner we have to kill. This poor woman, Carol, who already lost her adopted son, Gob, whom we actually meet in Moriarty's saloon in Megaton, but that's a story for another day. We have to kill her partner, Greta, just to please Azrakal. Well, we need to heed Azrakal's warning. We don't want to anger the entire underworld. So I waited until night, and yet Carol still stood at her post. It was well past one in the morning, but the place was still open. The place finally didn't close until two in the morning. At two in the morning, Greta and Carol climb into their queen-sized bed. Other residents of this inn, like Mr. Crowley, will come to bed, but many of the other underworld residents will continue to walk around and drink. So we still have to be careful. We need to assess fascinate her from a place of stealth. Once we are sure we are hidden, we can use a quiet weapon to perform the deed. <laughs> With Greta dead, we can loot her corpse. On her body, we find Carol's place supply key. Now the cash register is locked, but the key doesn't open it. However, if we unlock it, all we find is a small amount of caps. There is a safe on the ground behind the counter. It's unique in that it's smaller than safes we typically find in Fallout 3, but the key also does not work for this, so we have to pick the lock. Inside, we just find a stash of caps. Heading out into the restaurant and in portion, we find a locked refrigerator, and this is what the key opens. Making sure that we're hidden before we open it, inside, we find the inventory of Carol's shop. A lot of pre-war packaged food and a few drinks. After waiting until morning, we can go back to Carol and we see just how distraught she is after losing Greta. First Gob goes to see the world 
Now Greta is dead. Everyone I love leaves me, it seems. You're taking Greta's death really hard, aren't you? We've been together longer than you've been alive. It's just... You know, you think that you're going to be with someone forever. And then you wake up one day and... They're gone. Where do you go from there? With the deed done, we can go back to Azrakal at the Ninth Circle, who stands behind the counter clasping his hands with glee. Come, human. Come drown your sorrows. Cool. A human. I don't care. The caps all spend the same. About that deal we had, Greta is dead as promised. Is she now? Well, it seems that this arrangement worked out well for both of us. With the new profit I'll make from Greta's customers, I'll be able to hire a replacement for Sharon with plenty left over for myself. And you held up your end of the deal, my friend, and, and I am a man of his word. Sharon's contract is yours. You are his new employer. Congratulations. I'll give you the pleasure of informing him yourself. Alternatively, if we don't want to murder Greta, and we don't want to break poor Carol's heart, we can pony up the 2,000 caps. This is ultimately what I chose to do in my playthrough. I suppose that could work, yes? Yes. Here's the contract. And I'll take my payment in full. Regardless of the choice we made, we finally get Sharon's employment contract. Sadly, this isn't a document we can read with our Pip-Boy. Instead, it's a simple miscellaneous item. With the contract in hand, we can go to Sharon and tell him that he now works for us. Talk to... Ah, uh, uh, oh no, none of that. You belong to me now. I belong to no one. If you are my new employer, then I will serve you. All right, slow down there, Sharon. I've got some good news for you. I'm your new employer. You purchased my contract from Razrakal. So I am no longer in his service. That is good to know. Please wait here. I must take care of something. Sharon, the tall, imposing ghoul of a man, slowly strides over to Azrakal behind the bar. Azrakal, I am told that I am no longer in your service. That's right, Sharon. Have you come to say goodbye? Yes. All right, let's go. Whoa! What was that for? Azrakal was an evil bastard. So long as he held my contract, I was honor bound to do as he commanded. But now you are my employer, which freed me to rid the world of that disgusting rat. And now, for good or ill, I serve you. Yikes, will remind me never to get rid of your contract. <laughs> All right, Sharon, let's go. As you wish. Oh my god, he shot I, Azrakal. I thought Sharon liked Azrakal. With Azrakal dead, we can do a bit of snooping to learn exactly how evil he was. His body is in bits of bloody pieces scattered all over the bar, but on his corpse we can loot the Ninth Circle Supply Key, and we can finally turn off that Tagon radio. We can use the key to open the refrigerator. Inside we find his inventory, just like Carol's refrigerator stored hers. Inside we find a stash of caps, some drinks, and some chems. If we hack into Azrakal's terminal, we find a note on many of the residents of the underworld. Here we learn that Azrakal had been paying close attention to Carol, and he noticed that she had become mopey. This likely occurred when Gob left the underworld. Perhaps over the 15 years he has been gone, she's been worried sick about him. But Azrakal doesn't care about her, he just wants to medicate her. He says, she might be a good customer for the special stock that I have, that is, the chems he has, but only if he could get her away from Greta. Greta is keeping Carol from leaning upon chems to fight her depression. So that's why Azrakal wanted Greta dead. It wasn't because he wanted to kill the competition, otherwise he would have just killed Carol. He sees a great customer in Carol for his chems, but Greta is keeping Carol from buying his chems, and so he sends you 
to kill Greta. With Greta gone, Carol becomes even more depressed, and who does she go to but none other than Azrakal to fix her problem? Sharon is right, Azrakal was indeed an evil, evil ghoul. We also learn that Patchwork spends all of the money that he gets from begging here with Azrakal at the Ninth Circle. He's not a very trustworthy guy, Azrakal's caught him behind the counter a few times, but at least he comes every day to spend his money on booze. Snowflake is his best chem customer. Snowflake comes in to buy up all of his jet, and he regularly keeps coming back for more. Snowflake is, of course, the barber here in town. But Azrakal seems to think that he's not a really good one. His final note is on Dr. Barrow, the only doctor in town. And he covets all of the wonderful chems that Dr. Barrow keeps in his clinic. He's trying to plan a way to get Dr. Barrow out of town so that he can sneak in and steal all the chems. It's also here where we learn that Riley from Riley's Rangers is kept in the clinic unconscious. From here, we can unlock the wall safe. And in the wall safe, we just find some ammo, money, and a stealth boy. Now, Sharon, true to his character, is not a big talker. If we try to interact with him, we can command him like a companion, choose how he fights, talk to him about his combat tactics, trade equipment, or dismiss him. And that's it. He doesn't talk to us about his past. I took a look at Sharon's script. It's every scrap of text that he has the capacity to say. And aside from telling us that we're the third person that Mr. Crowley has tried to hire to assassinate those targets during the quest, you gotta shoot him in the head, there are only two other moments where he has something unique to say. Towards the end of the game, when we need to go into a highly irradiated place to turn on Project Purity, if we don't have Broken Steel installed, he tells us that he's not going to do it. He, after all, has saved us a number of times. He says, this one is all on you. But if we do have Broken Steel installed, he agrees to go in and turn on Project Purity. The only other time he has something interesting to say is if you bring him to Vault 87, near Little Lamplight. You can attempt to order him to go inside to retrieve the Garden of Eden creation kit, the Gek. However, if we try and tell him to go inside and get it, he tells us that the contract that we have only entitles us to his combat services. He says, I'm no one's errand boy, and I'm afraid you'll have to get it yourself. And that's about it. This makes Sydney, the temporary companion that we get in the National Archives, a more fleshed out character than Sharon. We can sit down with Sydney and ask her questions about her past and her father. We don't get any of that with Sharon. So if that's all that's in the game about Sharon, what can we conclude about him? What do we know? Well, there are a couple of things. First is his name, Sharon. The name Sharon comes from Greek mythology, where a creature named Sharon or Charon was a ferryman who ferried the souls of the dead across a river to Hades. The river's name changes depending on what type of mythology you're reading. In Greek mythology, it was called the River Acheron. In Roman mythology, it was called the River Styx. Like the Ninth Circle of Hell, Sharon appears in Dante's Inferno, where he beats sinners who don't want to go to Hades onto his boat using his oar. The symbolism here, I think, is clear. Sharon from Greek mythology isn't his own master. He's placed in one place right at the River Acheron and is given the job, whether he likes it or not, to take the dead and bring them to hell. Sharon in Fallout 3, likewise, is not his own master. He has an employer, an employer who tells him who to kill. That is, who to send to hell. The question is whether or not he's always been known as Sharon. Is it a name he calls himself? Is it the name his mother gave him? Or is it a name that Azrakal gave him? We don't really know. I think, however, that his name has been with him for a very long time. The contract that we get from Azrakal, after all, is called Sharon's Contract. And this contract presumably is the same contract that Azrakal bought from whomever brainwashed him. Which means that the people who brainwashed him probably called him Sharon. My bet, then, is that it was they, the people who brainwashed him, who named him Sharon. Which means that his destiny was forged by somebody else. Someone brainwashed Sharon to become the deadly killer that he is. They purposefully chose to give him the fitting name, Sharon. 
Another notable thing about Sharon is that he's significantly taller than any other human or ghoul in the game. Maybe he has Dutch genes. Possible, but then why is he in Washington, D.C.? Maybe he's a pre-war ghoul. And he lived a life eating very healthy food, absorbing a lot of calories, which caused him to grow really tall. And so he seems like a giant when compared to people of the wasteland who have likely had a calorie restrictive diet their entire lives. Again, possible, but then why are other pre-war ghouls like Carol not as tall as Sharon? He could be suffering from giantism, but giants tend to be bigger all around, not just taller. But Sharon is just taller. Ultimately, I don't think his height is that important. It makes him a tall, imposing character and a great bodyguard. Some of the tallest people in the world are the Dutch. The average height of a man from the Netherlands is 1.838 meters, which is just over six feet, but he doesn't have a Dutch accent, and ultimately we don't have enough evidence to conclude that he's Dutch. Another tidbit about his background that's really interesting is when Azrakul tells us that he had been brainwashed. He grew up around a very interesting group of individuals who brainwashed him. Now, why would a cult brainwash a man that he has to obey whomever owns his contract? Well, this is another thing we can't answer with concrete evidence, because I'm sure there are quite a few cults that have evolved since the bombs dropped. For example, in Boston, in Fallout 4, we find the Pillars of the Community cult at the Charles View Amphitheater, led by a strong personality, Brother Thomas. He's unrelated to any other cult we've found in the game. It's possible that Sharon could have been raised in a cult-like community similar to the Pillars of the Community. One of the best-known cults in the game is, of course, the Habologists. They play a prominent role in Fallout 2, and we get to meet them in Nuka World. Or... Maybe he had been brainwashed by the Tree Minders. Even though Harold wants to die, the Tree Minders worship him as a god. Maybe they felt that it was good to have someone to protect Harold and the other Tree Minders from outside threats. And so they found young Sharon, raised him, and brainwashed him to be a bodyguard without moral scruples for whomever owned the contract. But then somehow they lost him. Ultimately, this is all speculation. We don't really know his past. All we know is that he was at one point brainwashed. Which brings us to a moral dilemma. Are we just as bad as Azrakul by buying his contract and using it? After all, Sharon is clearly a damaged person. Maybe we should try to convince him that he shouldn't be bound to a contract. No one should. Maybe we should burn the contract and tell him you're free, Sharon. Be your own master. Are we exploiting this poor victimized man by taking him with this out into the dangerous places of the capital wastelands where he could possibly be killed? That's certainly one way to look at it, but we don't have an opportunity to burn his contract and we never have an opportunity to try and convince him that he shouldn't live this way. Instead, he simply does and we can't do anything about it. That's the reality that we have. So we really have two choices. We can leave his contract with Azrakul, a man whom Sharon believes is evil and allow Azrakul to force Sharon to do all sorts of horrible atrocities, making the world a worse place and only enriching Azrakul. Or we can take that contract for ourselves and redeem Sharon, give him something a little bit nobler to do with his time, use him as a force of good. Now, of course, we can't get past the reality that we are using him. We're taking advantage of a damaged mind to get what we want done. If the game gave us the option to release Sharon from his contract, then that's what I would choose to do. I think that would clearly be the best option for Sharon. But since we don't have that option, I think the best option of the only two that we have is to take Sharon's contract and help direct his energy towards things that are good. But what about you? What did you do with Sharon when you found him? Did you take his contract or did you leave him with Azrakal? Did you kill Greta to get it or did you go ahead and fork over the caps? Let me know what you did in the comments section below. I read all of your comments and I use your comments as inspiration for my future videos. I publish six videos a week, so if you wanna make sure that you don't miss my next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I've got a t-shirt shop, folks. That's right, if you would like to buy an Oxhorn or a follow 
Fallout inspired t-shirt, you can find a link to my shop in the description below. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.